Hey everyone, David Easterbrook here. Today we're going to be doing something that you've been asking for for a very long time. I'm taking you for a tour of my personal bonsai collection. So get ready for an epic visit. You may have noticed that um, the name of my channel has been changed from David Easterbrook to Bonsai Society. That's because we're cooking up some new projects that you're going to find out about at the end of this YouTube. Also, you're going to notice a vast improvement in the quality of these videos. My son Nick has hired a professional videographer to do them. And you can also help us by sharing these videos, by sending us comments, and subscribing, getting your friends and workmates and colleagues to uh, sharing this video with them. This is where I keep my bonsai collection in summer. Here we are in Montreal, Quebec, which is in Canada, and we're in August. So the middle of summer, it's very warm outside today, and the trees are just loving it. It's been a long, wet summer. So I'm going to show you different species of trees that I grow. I actually grow about 60 different species of bonsai of trees as bonsai. It's a very eclectic collection. You'll see many, many different um, uh, genuses and species. Okay, so here we have junipers. Um, and these are very old specimens that are anywhere from 50 to 60 years old. Um, <clears throat> a lot of dead wood, a lot of uh, shari and gin on them. You can see all these, the dead wood on them. And we'll keep on going. We'll see some more of the collection. Now I have three tables of junipers. Uh, a lot of these are San Jose junipers, Prostra Prostata junipers. Uh, we also have Shimpaku junipers over here. So many different species and varieties of juniper. They're being grown in full sun because junipers are conifers that like full sun. The next series of four tables are all larch. Now larch are native to Canada and many, many of these trees were collected uh, from the tundra in the far north of Quebec many, many, many years ago. And they're They've been worked on for many years, and they're still being worked on to create beautiful specimens. So you'll see some <laughs> wonderful specimens. This kabudachi, many, many trunks sharing the same root base. Now these here are some of my large sized specimens. This here is a very old larch that's still in training, still working on the dead wood in creating the lower branches on this tree. We have this one, this larch here, uh, that's been bent back severely. This is going in the U.S. National Show in the beginning of September, about three weeks from now. We've got other beautiful old larches. This one was entirely created from one branch, from one living branch. So. Here we have a large forest uh, made of individual trunks, individual trees. It's called a Yosei Yue. Um, <clears throat> this forest here is created from one single tree. It's called Netsuranari, or root connected style. Another root connected style here. So these are quite old. Now th this one over here is a much younger one. I've just started growing it on this beautiful rock just this spring. So it has many years of training in front of it. Here we have some tables of medium size large trees and there's a plethora of different styles and shapes. Here we have a windswept larch on a beautiful um, old piece of slate. Here we have a little wind blowing slanting style um, <coughs> grouping of larch that are all root connected. Uh, <coughs> we have a very tall uh, shokan style, a straight style. We have a very large 
windswept larch tree here on a beautiful Karama stone that came from Japan. Over here, beautiful, look at this beautiful semi-cascade larch here. Or we have beautiful here, uh, this is a bunshin or a literati style tree with a beautiful cherry. They call it Ikari Jin. A beautiful top that's called Ikari Jin. Informal upright styles here, here, and here is a, a little beauty, a little gem, a little slanting style with another beautiful gin rising <laughs> over the top of the tree. One of my favorite larches in my collection is this beautiful cascading larch. This also is going into the U.S. National Show this fall. And um, this one had the trunk turned back on itself three times. Sleeping under my cascading larch is our pet cat. His name is Oreo. Guess why? Black and white. <laughs> I have two tables of pines, and I have many, many, many different uh, species of pine. Uh, this one here is a very dwarf variety of Scots pine, 50-year-old uh, dwarf Scots pine that I grew from a very young nursery specimen. Uh, over here, the beginnings of um, a literati-style Japanese white pine. Uh, it still needs wiring. and. Uh, Look at this for a, an interesting literati or uh, literati style Japanese black pine. Okay. <laughs> yeah, over here, a very large forest of Alberta spruce, dwarf Alberta spruce, Picea conica um, albertiana, forest of dwarf Alberta spruce. I've never shown it uh, either in exhibitions or um, even to you guys on YouTube because it's just big and unwieldy so I just basically enjoy it for myself here's a tree that everybody could uh, find and work on this is a just a regular Scots pine uh, a small nursery tree that's been trained for about 20 years now I'm uh, transforming it into a literati style uh, you can see it's still wired up. Many of the trees in my collection are still in training. This next one here with the pink flag, the pink flag means that the tree desperately needs to be unwired, uh, is still in training, but this is an interesting tree. It's our native white pine, Pinus strobus. They're harder to transform into bonsai, but I think this one is coming along real well. Uh, over here, this was, I just acquired this. This is a, a native jack pine, okay, Pinus banksiana. Uh, it's very weak. Um, in the spring, I'm going to repot it and start working on it. It's a beautiful old tree, but it needs a lot of TLC. This here tree is an Austrian black pine, Pinus nigra, and I actually created it from a very old bonsai, I air layered off the top. It took 10 years to get new roots and this is the bottom branch that I saved and made into a semi-cascade style. Another Scots pine in semi-cascade style over here. Now let's go a bit further here and we'll show you some other little tree here is a Japanese red pine. Okay, Pinus densiflora that I grew from seed about over 40 years ago. This here is a Pinus sylvestris buvrenensis is the cultivar name. Um, a beautiful little uh, cultivar for creating into bonsai. This is a Japanese white pine. I don't know the name of the cultivar. Uh, again, a beautiful cascading style. Uh, 
this, this Japanese black pine was imported from Japan, um, not by myself. Um, look at the beautiful taper that, um, of this, that this tree has. It starts so thick at the, at the bottom and finishes at a very narrow point on the top. This one here, I created from a very young seedling. Here we have my collection of uh, fruiting trees. Uh, we're starting off with a collected apple in the semi-cascade style. This one here is a crab apple. You can see it's full of small green apples. They're not ripe yet. This one is a uh, cultivar named Tina. Uh, here we have a um, Chinese quin uh, Japanese quince. And you can see the, the quince fruits. When they're ripe, they'll be turning yellow here. Okay. Uh, this also is a very nice... Uh, <clears throat> apple that I'm training into the, into this sem semi-cascade style. You can see how small the little crab apples are on this tree. It's being grown over a rock that I found on a volcano in Costa Rica. Here we have another crab apple, crab apple in the Mayogi or informal upright style. Uh, here we have a Prunus mume. They call it a, um, a flowering apricot, the first tree to bloom in the spring. Here is a flowering almond. Um, and on the other side of the table, we'll get to them, are um, twisted trunk pomegranates. Now you'll see that not all the trees in my collection are finished. This was a recently collected larch, maybe only four or five years ago and I haven't even started working on it yet. These two larches have had some preliminary work done on them. You can see the the straps and they've all been wired but they're still far from being finished uh, being ready to be put into a bonsai pot. Here we have Twisted trunk pomegranate in training, okay. Punica granatum nejicon. Over here, an Eliagnus that I grew from seed, okay. Thorny Eliagnus. It's nice about them. The reason why the Japanese like to have them in their bonsai collections is that they flower at the end of the summer. This one will be in flower by the end of this month and flower th through September. They have small white flowers that look like lilies of the valley. They smell very good. And then they'll set small red fruit during their dormancy period in the winter. So it's really fascinating because it does everything off season. Not many people grow Eliagnus's bonsai, but I really enjoy growing different species of trees as bonsai just because they are different. And this one was started from a small little seedling like this here. So it goes to show you that um, they, they do thicken up well and become wonderful bonsai and they can be grown indoors as well as outdoors. So here we have a European larch that I bought as nursery material and that I'm transforming it into bonsai, a bonsai. You can see how um, I've killed most of the original trunk and have brought up a new top to create uh, a new a new trunk line. You can get just as much enjoyment with growing native trees or uh, trees from Europe or other countries as you can with our own native species. These uh, European larch and also Japanese larch are just as hardy as our native larch here in Canada. For the ones that have been following my YouTube channel for several months, uh, this is a bonus for you. This is a uh, ficus benjamina that I transformed um, over three YouTube videos. So now you see what it looks like uh, several months later. You can see now that the scar where I reduced the trunk is healing over nicely. It'll take two or three years before it heals in completely, but it's growing very, very well, and in no time at all, you won't even notice. Here we have one of my trident maples, Acer wergerianum, 
And this one I developed from um, an older established tree that I bought in Boston. Oh boy, probably about uh, 20 years ago now. Uh, the roots were air layered. All of the branches up to here were all grafted onto the trunk. Only the upper part uh, is, is natural here. And I'm doing the same with uh, some other ones here. You can see that how this tree here, this uh, Japanese maple, is being transformed. Look at, the, look at the cut that I made many years ago here. And it was cut again here, the large scar that's healed over and up here and here and and on and on and on so this is a work in progress it's been about uh, 35 years that i've been working on this tree this is a more recent uh, work in progress another trident maple and you can see the scar tissue uh, there's an immense scar tissue all the way up where i um, created more taper on the trunk and here I'm growing a new top. This will be my front here. I've let this grow out and cut it off here. Now I'm letting this grow out and I will cut it off here until I get a very beautiful trunk with very nice taper right up to the top. Here we have a diverse variety of species. Here we have an Amer maple, okay, Acer genala. Um, we have a Chinese Celtus. Uh, over on this side, really pretty little Brazilian rain tree right here. You can see this slanting style rain tree, how beautiful it is. This one here is an American elm that I air layered off of a large tree about seven years ago now. And um, that's the way I get most of my trees. So this is um, a Catlin elm that I air layered and laid part of the branches on the ground. So you've both got a Cabudachi style and also Nesserineri style. Rampant root and um, multiple trunk style on the same tree. It's in a beautiful Reho pot. Magnolia here. And over here you'll see some trident maples being air layered. This is an air layer here. It hasn't rooted yet, but it'll be coming off soon. I was removing air layers today. I removed two from this Itoyigawa juniper. Uh, I just potted them up this morning, this one and this one. This is a strange variety of our native Thuya, or our native eastern white cedar. It was found on top of a mountain um, Mont saint pacombe um, about two and a half hours east of Montreal, and I recreated it from the mother plant through cuttings. Here we have one of my favorite thuyas. This one here is about 800 years old. It was found by a friend hanging over a waterfall, and he had to climb 40 feet in the air to dig it out from the rocks above the waterfall. It's been transformed into a slanting style though. We have my famous Meta Sequoia Forest. I created it over 40 years ago and it's been viewed by over 15 million people. Um, so it is probably one of the most famous bonsai on the face of the earth. Uh, that said, I it's Planted on a beautiful Karama stone, requires a lot of pruning, but it looks so natural, I just love it. Right here, we have a real sequoia, Sequoia sempervirens, and this was created from a small cutting the size of a toothpick about, I'd say about 28, 29 years ago. These two trees here are Camacypris. Uh, they're both Camacypris piscifera. This one here I created or I uh, 
I got a, there was a witch's broom on one of my bonsai and I did cuttings of it. So I don't e it doesn't even have a name. It was created from a witch's broom. It's a very dwarf variety of Camisiparis piscifera. I just showed this one in a show three weeks ago. Now this one here is a Camisiparis piscifera boulevard. They also call it Ciano viridis. And this I did it in a demonstration um, for the Green Mountain Bonsai Society in Vermont about 40 years ago. Last but not least, and not pruned unfortunately, is a native Canadian hemlock that was created from a forest here in, uh, from a, a clearing of a forest here in Quebec. Even though I'm getting on in years, I'm still constantly multiplying these trees, creating more. So this is my work of the last two weeks. Uh, these are all air layers that I removed from the mother plants. Uh, they're here slightly in the shade and I miss them about every half hour to keep them well uh, well misted until the roots can take over and and they'll they after that they'll live on their own. In the last few years I've sold a great deal of my thick trunk Japanese maples so here is a new generation of them. A lot of them were just started from air layers a few, in the past few years. They're coming along well. You can see this one is being re-air re layered. It's rooted so I'll be able to remove it. This one here is a Dishojo maple so it has bright red leaves in the spring. Uh, and if we continue over here we have an older Dishojo here that I actually grafted on the root base of a very old uh, maple tree so that it would have a very large nabari, a, a root base, very early on in life. Japanese maple is very dear to my heart. This tree belonged to my first bonsai teacher. His name was Jerry Stowell. He lived in Stockton, New Jersey. And when I was just getting started in bonsai, I often traveled to his home on the weekends where he would teach me the art of bonsai. So I would never part with a tree like this. It's got great memories for me. This one here is a sharps pygmy. It's, um, this one here is one, um, I gave it a, a name of Hiroshima because it came from the city of Hiroshima. This Japanese maple is another tree that is very dear to my heart. This one here is a Kiyohime Japanese maple. It's a very dwarf variety that I've been growing for close to 47 years. Um, it's a little grouping of three trees, mother tree, the younger one and the youngest, and it's planted in a beautiful pot that was specially made for it by Nick Lenz, who was a famous American potter who died two years ago. It's one of the larger pots that he ever made. So often um, bonsai means more than just owning trees. It's all of the memories, the flashbacks that come with growing them that is so important to bonsai growers. Many, many of the trees in my collection were inherited from people that have passed away. And I would never part with them because every time I work on them, it reminds me of their former owners. Tall trees, many bonsai need to be tied onto the tables because if it's a windy day, they get blown off the tables and the tops break off. So you have to be very careful, not only for the trees, but the pots are also very expensive and, um, and they're irreplaceable. This pot here was made by a very well-known uh, bonsai pot maker named John Evans, who lives in Florida in West Palm Beach. I don't know if John is still around, but I love this pot. So this, this here is a mixed forest. It's a forest of Japanese maples, Chinese elms, and there's two species of Korean hornbeams in this forest. Originally, I had planted Japanese beech and 
dwarf soyas to look like a Laurentian forest, but they got shaded out and died over the years. So over the years, I've been replacing them. Now, the forest today looks a little bit bare because it was actually pruned yesterday and I pruned it back heavily. So it looks a little, little bit weak, but it's not, it's very strong. This forest was shown in the US National probably about 10 years ago. Overgrown uh, Deshojo maple actually looks pretty wild, but um, I just removed three air layers from it uh, just about a week ago. And the interesting thing about this one is that I grew it from a very small cutting over 30 years ago. I planted it in a 25 inch square wooden box that was about five inches deep and kept it there for over 20 years and then I transplanted it into a very large Japanese training pot and it only went into a bonsai pot about two years ago. Everybody wants a big tree like this but nobody wants to wait for 30 years to get it but that's the whole part of bonsai is the weight, is the anticipation of having a tree with a great root base like this. This here is a Japanese maple. The cultivar name is Yao and I acquired it as a small cutting from Steve Polasic who now lives in I believe South Carolina and it's planted in a beautiful Nick Lenz pot. Uh, this tree has had many many uh, viewings because my wife uh, took pictures of it uh, one fall. It, the leaves were very bright red and orange and it's been reposted constantly on the internet ever since then. Here we have a Japanese maple forest. The trees were originally acquired from Brussels Bonsai Nursery by a fellow named Leo Morno and uh, Leo had asked me to make a forest with the trees he had bought and unfortunately Leo died before he saw the forest completed because I had told him that we had to grow them on for a few years to thicken up the trunks and get different trunk heights so um, Leo is probably enjoying it now from up above. The forest here is it dates back to the late 80s. Uh, Leo died in nine, eight, 1992, so it dates back over 30 years. Grouping of dwarf Japanese maples is planted on an Ibigawa stone. I bought the Ibigawa stone in Japan and the stone is uh, like a landscape stone. It represents a cliff overhanging a lake. You can see the lake here that's filled with water and these trees are hanging over the water. Now this planting includes uh, maples, there's uh, dwarf roses, there's azaleas and selaginella or golden fern all on the same rock. Uh, there's no holes in the rock. They're literally growing in a fine layer of keto soil. Another planting on a rock. I believe the, the stone comes from Ohio. And this is a Deshojo maple. So the leaves are outstandingly red in the spring. Scarlet red. Uh, and it's, it's beautiful. The, uh, color of this blue pot brings out the bright red color in the spring. Uh, this one was created from an air layer and has been on the rock for over 25 years. This lovely little Japanese maple is called a Murasaki Kiyohime. Murasaki means purple because when the new leaves come out in spring the edges are, are almost purple colored, the edges of the new leaves, as you can see. The rock is an interesting rock. The rock came from the bottom of Lake Champlain. There were divers that were diving to the bottom of the lake during the night and they would pull these out and um, 
Uh, I acquired three of them. So really interesting stones. This here is another little kabudachi of kotohime maples. And as you can see, it's growing over a diagonally placed Ibigawa stone that goes from here right over to here. Okay, so the tree is either called Ishitsuki or Sekijoju. Sekijoju means sitting on a rock. And this tree looks like it's literally straddling the rock. See how tiny the leaves are on this maple. The Koto Hime maple is a, uh, it's a dwarf variety of Japanese maple and the leaves are some of the tiniest that can be found. Uh, this has an unusual growth habit. It's very vertical, so it's harder to create as a bonsai. You have to wire the branches down when they're very young, otherwise they'll just snap. Some more maple groupings. These ones here are trident maples. And the interesting part about this one is, is it's called a raft style. I actually air layered off a branch and it had a secondary branch that I laid along the ground. So all these trunks were actually branches coming off one branch. So it's, it's actually just one tree. Here we have a forest that I made of individual trident maples except um, <clears throat> this one here I grafted onto the main trunk to have a tree that was real close to it. So you can see how they've uh, fused together now, the, these two trunks. The others will eventually fuse together also. And they're in the elm or elm family. Here we have a Zelkova. The, the common name is a Japanese gray bark elm. And you can see this tree I bought at a bonsai convention in 1989 um, and developed it over the years. It's planted in a beautiful pale gray Nicklens pot. Here we have a wonderful forest of Celtus. Celtus are hackberry. These are trees I grew from seed and the seed came from Japan. So it's Celtus sinensis var japonica. And they were grown from seed. And you can see after I grew them, I started the seeds in 1992. You can see after all these years how the trunks have all fused together into this beautiful forest. This also was in the National many, many years ago. Or this beautiful here, this Chinese Celtus that I grew from a very small cutting um, in a beautiful broom style, the way it spreads out. Um, when they first start off, a lot of people don't like them. They think it looks too natural, that um, the, you know there was no work involved in doing it. There is a lot of work. If you look closely, you'll see all of the old wire marks from years and from 30 years ago on this tree. Here is a younger um, cutting from, from that tree and you can see how every single branch has been wired upwards to create that beautiful broom style. Now we're getting into some of my favorites, American elms that are grown in the broom style because that's the natural style for American elms. Fortunately, when we grow them as bonsai, the, uh, the beetles don't seem to, um, the Japanese beetles, to bother them, so they never get Dutch elm disease. So here's one I grew from a seedling, okay? Found it in a crack in the sidewalk, actually. It was just a, a no bigger than a toothpick. Again, I'm growing in a broom style, and the reason why I do that is because here in Quebec, uh, we still have beautiful fields with beautiful old American elms that were not killed by the, uh, the Dutch elm disease. And they inspire me to try to recreate that feeling of those American elms in the fields.
this here is a native red elm and the reason it has no leaves was about two or three days ago I defoliated it to try to get smaller slightly smaller leaves they'll come back in about a week so I'll have new leaves this is about the end of the line after this I'm not defoliating any longer here we have two interesting dwarf elms they're uh, Ulmus Minor J Jacqueline Hillier and I actually bought the mother tree here this one was a a sacrificial branch from down below. I actually bought the mother tree from Bill Valavanis when I was in my 20s. So that would be about 50 years ago. Uh, he was selling them in small four inch pots. Yes, I bought the mother tree from Bill Valavanis, who's a famous bonsai artist. Also, he's the organizer of the US National Bonsai Exhibition. Uh, Bill started doing bonsai at the age of 16 years old and he has a nursery called the International Bonsai Arboretum. That's where I, where I bought the young rooted cutting. Um, as I said, I was in my 20s at the time. So I've had this tree for a very, very long time. This is Novi, and um, this one here was obviously collected in Korea many, many years ago. I went through two owners before it got to me. Uh, it's in a beautiful antique Japanese container and um, I'm just redeveloping it. Here is a um, just a, a ginkgo biloba, a regular, that I started when I was very young. So this tree is well over 50 years old now uh, and I actually I removed most of the branches and I'm uh, redesigning it. So very, very old ginkgo biloba. New varieties coming out. This here is a ginkgo biloba, but it's a, um, a cultivar called Folker Select. And the leaves are no bigger than my thumbnail. And that's the biggest they'll get. It's absolutely amazing. I hear that it, it came from, it was discovered on Vancouver Island in Canada. highly desirable variety of ginkgo. It uh, comes from Japan and it's called a chichi icho. Icho means ginkgo. Chichis mean these very interesting protuberances and they hang down. Chichis actually means breasts and they hang down from the trunk and the branches or actually grow up from the roots and it makes it hi highly desirable in Japan as a bonsai specimen. Here we've got um, a ginkgo forest made of natural ginkgos and this was done many many years ago from seeds collected in a park and as you know ginkgos date back from the time of the dinosaurs so we've got a little dinosaur under there to remind us of that. Ginkgo forest this was grown from seed so this is the natural size of the leaves actually very quite large um, now there's all kinds of new cultivars, new varieties coming along, as I said earlier, with very, very tiny leaves, um, which are much more interesting to use as bonsai material. There's new varieties called Munchkin, Folker Select, uh, Chase Manhattan. Uh, there's just so many on the market now. Here we've got a little uh, grouping of privet all one tree again, and um, this is a um, <clears throat> I'm trying to think. is the name the the Japanese name is ibota. The common name is Legustrum obtusifolium. Very hardy here in Canada. Uh, often used as hedging material, but they make great bonsai. They're in the olive family. They have very very small leaves. Beautiful fragrant white flowers in the spring. Uh, they're very, very vigorous. They take to pruning very, very well. Uh, excellent, excellent species to grow as bonsai. Here we have a nice little root over rock style boxwood. Uh, great trees to work with, dwarf foliage, vigorous, fun, fun bonsai material. Another uh, species that I really like are lindens. Um, and this here is a dwarf linden called Tico dwarf. It's um, European linden, 
but the variety is Tika Old Dwarf, much smaller leaves. This is a regular sized European linden, so you can see how large the leaves are compared to the dwarf linden here, okay? So this was created from a, from a seedling. Over here, um, in training, is a Stewartia monodelpha. Uh, they're in the Camellia family, and uh, they're a little bit, I find, uh, divas. They, they're a little bit um, harder to grow, but I'll get, I'll get it done. We have one here, uh, Stewartia pseudocamellia. They form very large white flowers in the summer. It's not as vigorous as it would be if it was growing on the northwest coast, say in Seattle. But still, um, I protect it in winter, bring it in out of the cold. It is hardy outside in Canada when it's planted in the ground here in Montreal. <clears throat> we have a, a wonderful English oak that I've been growing, oh boy, for probably, again, over 45 years. And, and this one here was created from a, just a trunk that was broken near the base. So it's been a long time in training, but it's one of my favorite specimens. This alder uh, was featured in one of my YouTube videos. So um, if you go back a few, to, you'll, you'll see its transformation. Here we have, it's a variegated variety, and you can see how it's developed since last year. A very vigorous grower. Some of my very favorite trees, I should never pick them up by the trunk, I have to reach over. This here is a euonymus, okay? Um, I'm trying to think of the common name of euonymus, and uh, sometimes they call it a burning bush, and the leaves turn very bright red in the fall. And this one here is a, a Japanese variety that came from the Sakhalin Islands. I grew it from seed, and you can see the beautiful trunk movement. Now, generally when they grow, the trunks are very, very straight. So you can see the result of wiring over many years, the beautiful graciousness, and how the tree has become very elegant. This one here is another one. Now this one is Euonymus alatus, um, and you can see that um, it's forming wings, and this one also will turn very bright red in the fall. Uh, beautiful trunk movement, and it's also in a beautiful reho pot. See, all of these trees are filling up my tables. My tables are overcrowded. I'm just lacking space. Um, I probably have over 500 bonsai specimens. It requires a tremendous amount of work. I do most of it on my own, but on Tuesdays I have a couple of assistants, um, people, retired people that come over and help me with the pruning and the wiring and especially the unwiring and the repotting in spring. So it does require a tremendous amount of, of work, of effort to keep all these trees looking good. They're not, they don't always look great. Uh, they're not always perfectly pruned, but we get to them eventually. You guys that have been following my videos in the last few months, this here was one of my YouTube videos. This here is an American um, Solastris, Solastris scandens, and um, it's a vining plant that grows up tree trunks eventually can choke them off. The beautiful autumn fruiting bonsai. So there are many, many other varieties that you can use as bonsai. This one here is a magnolia. This here is a gruia from South Africa. Here we have a a Japanese beech, Fagus Granata, which makes wonderful hardy bonsai. We have um, a honeysuckle bush here, honeysuckle, 
and some wonderful uh, <coughs> ilex or hollies, native hollies. This one here, in, in about a month, all the berries will be bright red, a beautiful autumn fruiting bonsai. So here we have more trees in training, Caragana sinica, and uh, many, many other varieties, Eliagnus. And um, here at the end, we have a very nice tamarix. This tamarix was uh, featured in a YouTube video. And if you people would like to um, have more follow-up on what happened to the uh, demo trees in the videos, just get in touch with us, tell us, and we'll, um, we'll show them to you in the future. Here, my friends, are a lot of trees in training. Um, they're all going to be transformed into bonsai in the upcoming years. And we still have a diversity of species on these tables that maybe you'd like to see. Here and here we have some Caragana sinica that form beautiful either yellow or orange flowers, both colors on the same tree in the fall. More hollies with small berries, magnolias. <coughs> Here is a burning bush again. And here at the end, we have a, a weeping style tamarix that um, was featured in one of my YouTubes. So if you'd like to find out what happened to these trees and catch up on um, how they're developing, just send us a line and we'll be pleased to feature them in the upcoming uh, YouTubes. Okay, everyone, that concludes today's tour of my personal bonsai collection. I would have liked to have spent so much more time explaining each individual tree. Uh, just no time. This collection represents years and decades of my life, uh, spending so much time and energy working on these trees. I've made so many new friends, I have current friends, and even friends that have passed away and now I'm continuing by growing their bonsai. So bonsai has a special meaning for all of us and I hope that um, you'll all enjoy it as much as I do every day. Lastly, I um, tease you a bit at the beginning of this video saying that I had changed the, uh, the channel from David Easterbrook to Bonsai Society. That's because my son, two years ago, my son Nicholas, decided that he wanted to create something new. He wanted to uh, pull me out of bonsai anonymity so that I could share my wealth of bonsai knowledge with all of you out there. And uh, to do this, he's going to be um, putting out a line of bonsai apparel which is not, it's not available right now. It will be available in the near future. Um, it's going to look like this with Bonsai Society. You can see on the back of this one, it's got the logo from my old business, okay? Um, it's a tree still in my collection. So I hope you'll encourage us to keep getting out this, this important information on Bonsai and that you'll follow us in the future.